Well, welcome everyone. I'm glad you could join us this morning, um, or this afternoon, actually, <laughs> depending upon where you're dialing in from. Um, and as James mentioned, my name is Karen Morton. I'm actually a senior technical consultant working for Incatech. Um, and what we're going to be covering today is, uh, as Jane men mentioned, is the topic, how to gather SQL resource consumption metrics in Oracle. That's, uh, that's quite a mouthful, but uh, hopefully I can get through a few things um, that are uh, relatively simple that you can do that will help you to get all the data you need to help problem diagnose um, the SQL statements that your applications are running. Um, so. Uh, just a bit, again, of information about how you can find me. Um, my email address is here. Again, I believe James will put this up again at the end, so uh, or a, a similar slide to this, so you'll have it there as well. Um, I blog at karenmorton.blogspot.com and uh, tweet occasionally at karen underscore morton. Um, as James mentioned, I am a proud member of the Oak Table Network, um, an Oracle ace, and I've uh, actually co-authored three um, different A-Press books on the Oracle um, genre, so um, uh, all good there. So as we get started, I wanted to kind of set the stage with this quote that has always been one of my favorites. Um, if you can't measure it, you can't manage, manage it. And this is really what um, being able to gather resource consumption metrics um, for your SQL segments is all about. Um, just because you get the right answer for um, uh, the, the SQL that you've executed, in other words, it brings back the data that you want, um, that's just one small piece of it. Um, but unfortunately, we tend to focus on the answer, the what, instead of the how we do things. Um, so really what this talk is about is about how your SQL executes, what kind of um, resources does it use, so that you can get your arms around what is it doing in order to get the answer and is that a good thing, a bad thing? Does it take too long? Does it use too many resources so that it may not scale if you have more than a handful of users um, executing that statement at the same time? All of this and these kinds of questions you can get answers to by um, collecting the proper data. So when you're talking about performance problems in um, light of SQL statements, there's really two types of performance problems, um, if you really think about it. There's response time problems, and that's the one that people scream about, right? I mean, everybody knows when you've got a, uh, a problem with a particular query, when you, the phone is ringing and people are screaming and, you know, they're, they're like, oh, this is slow, this is slow. Um, so that's the obvious one. It takes too long for something to run. But there's another type of problem, and this is the type of problem where um, it hasn't actually raised its head yet. There are inefficiencies that are out there hiding or lurking in your SQL that haven't presented themselves as a response time problem yet. Okay? So, and this happens very frequently. We often see problems hide from us through our development and QA and even through load testing phases. But when we put it in production and we get under real load, under real stress, problems start to appear. So um, in reality then what we want to do is we want to be able to attack both types of problems for these tasks that the business cares about, whether it's a report or an online um, screen or what have you. Um, you care about them because inefficiencies, even though they may not be noticeable yet as response times problems, they are problematic for you if you don't want the natives to get restless, right? I mean, our users are sitting out there, our management's sitting out there. We don't want them clamoring at us and knocking on our door, particularly in the heat of the day, you know, when um, uh, everyone's using the system and things get really slow and you're on some kind of a sit call and it's just crazy. We want to avoid this kind of situation, or at least I do. So the other reason why that we really care is when you use too many resources, it's all about waste. And waste is going to cost you, actually your company as well, money. A small amount of waste can translate to um, perhaps additional dollars spent on hardware. So think about it. I mean, this is the Exadata solution these days in, in many places. Um, uh, they haven't dealt with 
inefficiencies in code, and so they throw hardware at it, whether it's Exadata or you know new boxes, new um, with faster CPUs and faster disk storage and all of that. There is money that gets spent to kind of um, mask or compensate for um, waste in our code. Um, along with that, uh, you're going to have increased labor costs. So labor for the hardware to be installed, for you know your your development teams and your uh, DBAs and your sysadmin guys and all this to put in the time and the effort to kind of work through what the results of this waste are doing. Um, which means ultimately your software is actually going to cost more, right? So to not only to develop it, but to kind of let it continue to be inefficient on top of this other uh, work that you're now putting in and these expenditures for hardware and so on. So that ultimately the total cost of ownership for your system is escalated way beyond what it ever should have been. So waste is going to make your other work go slower. So if you're doing too much of something in order to get the answer for your SQL statement, it's very likely that other things, which may be very well oiled, very well optimized and tuned to do what they need to do, but if you've got some bad stuff out there that is wasting resources, the good stuff is actually going to go slower. So if you got fast stuff and it's waiting behind slow stuff, it's slow, right? So waste is the root cause of so many problems that we may not be able to see early on unless we focus on what kind of resources it consumes um, before we let it get into our production environments and so forth. So another thing that I really like, it's uh, uh, Kerry Millsap uh, with Method R has used this phrase for a, a number of years and I really uh, am a believer in it. Why guess when you can know? So all of this is how do you collect the data so that you're not guessing but that you know whether or not something is going to perform well and if it's not performing well, where do you need to focus your attention in order to fix the problem? and get it performing back in line with what you need. So um, in order to uh, collect or review these metrics, we have to be looking at two things, time and resources. Time is the obvious one. It's how long does something take, and people have their um, tolerance for how long something can take and it still be tolerable or acceptable to them. Uh, for some of our applications, we actually have SLAs or agreements in place that say, you know, so much percentage of the time we have to have our queries return in X number of seconds or so forth. Whether you actually have um, agreements in place that you have to meet or you're simply looking to meet user expectation, time is usually number one. But behind time, if you really want to deal with the scalability of your queries, and um, the ability to measure and therefore manage those queries and how they perform, we got to talk about resources. So let's uh, start simple. Now what I'm going to show you in the next few minutes are things that can all be ran via um, SQL Plus. Um, many of them, there's also going to be a set of um, SQL statements that you can execute yourself in order to get this data back. So regardless of your tool, whether you're in SQL Plus doing it kind of command line, or if you use any other tool like SQL Developer or any other graphical tool that may be available to you, most of these things um, allow you to utilize um, either the feature or the SQL statement that will produce the output um, through whatever tool you use. So just for simplicity, I use the SQL Plus tool um, for demo purposes, and frankly, I use it most frequently in my day-to-day -day work as well because it's common. It's always there. So one of the features of SQL Plus is the auto-trace ability. So with auto-trace, there's a couple of things um, that I'll also mention before we start that. There's, um, uh, through this initial part of the resource consumption metrics that we're going to be looking at, um, if you're in SQL Plus, I like to have my timing turned on so that I actually get an elapsed time for each statement that executes. And I also, in my test environment, like to set the statistics level parameter for my session equal to all. Now, by default, it's set to typical. 
Now, Typical does collect a lot of metrics, but it leaves off some extra detail that you can glean when you set it to all. And I think that's very important when you are trying to diagnose a problem or to get enough data um, to understand how something is using resources. Now, you'll notice I did also put under here that there is a hint, the Gather Plan Statistics hint, that can be added to a single query in order to give you the same um, data back as that you would get if statistics level was set to all. So if you want to um, uh, have this collection level in place for uh, across the board, then the session parameter will work well for you. If you simply want to um, collect higher level um, data for a query at a time, then using the hint um, may be a, a good choice for you. So I just wanted to mention that. So for my tests, I've got these things turned on. I will also give you one other quick um, uh, warning, and that is that with statistics level set to all, um, it is going to um, you know, require um, uh, some resources in order to collect that level of detail. So what you may see is that you may see a query that runs in one second running in a little bit longer than that. So maybe by a few um, milliseconds or hundreds, cents of seconds, hundreds of seconds, um, uh, or even longer depending upon how long the query runs and so forth. So just know that you will get a little bit of measurement intrusion, if you will, when you have it set to that level. Um, but uh, again, it's terrific diagnostic data, and I recommend it for testing purposes. So with AutoTrace, um, I use AutoTrace Trace only. Um, I do that because I really typically don't care about displaying the answer, the result set. And if you just set AutoTrace on, you'll get the result set, then you'll get your, um, your metrics. And for my purposes, I really don't care about the answer at this point. I just want data. So auto trace trace only will give you that. So um, this is the statement that um, I'm actually going to be looking at, and I'm going to use it throughout our examples um, uh, for the rest of the webinar. So what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to flip over into a, um, a word processor here or a little text editor so that I can walk you through these examples. Um, and hopefully you can see this a little bit better than the smaller print on the, um, the slides. So um, again, here's the statement. So I set my auto trace to trace only. Um, and I have a fairly good sized statement um, in here. So I didn't pick something really simple so you could actually see a little bit more detail. What I see is it completed returning 307 rows and took um, just a tad over 34 seconds. Um, if you look at what follows, I get an execution plan. Now, this is the execution plan. It's what Oracle actually did. But here's the interesting part is all of this data that comes in the rows, bytes, cost, time, all these columns out here is, um, uh, are the estimates. So this is what I would call the explain plan data. Now, for most of you, you may be aware, but just to reiterate, um, if you're not, a explain plan is what the optimizer thinks it is going to do. It is the set of operations that um, it believes will be used when the query is executed in order to derive the answer or to get the answer. The execution plan is what actually did happen, and those two can be different. So one thing that I want to caution you for is um, uh, about is that when you are using or trying to gather metrics, make sure you are getting execution plan data and you're getting the actual data, not just the estimates. Okay. Now, as you'll notice over here, the time says it's about 39 seconds, and we see that it was 34. This is a measure that is semi-accurate in the time column. Um, if you were to look at just the explain plan, you would actually see the time being estimated as longer than that. So when AutoTrace runs, this is a, um, uh, an estimation of, um, of the, the actual time. So you're getting a little bit of detail there. However, um, uh, the part that I really wanted to show you, and I'm going to pop past this predicate data for just a second, is the statistics. At this point, what you'll see is consistent gets and physical reads. These are the two primary metrics that you get with AutoTrace. 
And consistent gets are the logical IOs. It's when Oracle has to um, reach into memory into the um, buffer cache in order to retrieve a block of data. So what we see here is about 1.7 million blocks of data were, um, uh, were accessed out of the buffer cache. You see also about the same number also were physical reads. So what that tells me is that through all of the activity of the plan, um, pretty much everything was read physically. And if you notice, if I scroll back up here, pretty much all of my accesses are full table scans. So with that, I would expect a lot of physical read activity um, just because of the nature of how full scans work. So um, uh, index blocks typically tend to stay around in the buffer cache much longer than uh, full scanned blocks. They kind of come and go um, in order to not clog up the buffer cache quite so much. So, um, so with all of these full scans, that really is kind of a behavior that I would have um, expected. Well, this is great that I know that it took about that many um, block accesses to, to retrieve my rows. I don't know if you noticed in the statement, but this says it's only retrieving 307 rows. Well, that's a, uh, uh, an aggregate query was actually in place. It was doing sums or counts, mins, maxes, an aggregate function was actually involved. So although it returned 307 rows, that was grouped totals. So it actually um, touched a whole lot more records than 307. But with this particular data, I don't really see that. So one thing that I wanted to, to show you was if I want to get more data now, um, so if, if this is good, it's a starting point, I can get some idea, but I, so far I can't really tell is that good or is that bad, um, and I'm, I'm thinking maybe I could make it a little better or not. Um, I need more information. Well, one thing that I wanted to point out to you was um, some scripts that I have. Um, all of these scripts are, um, uh, are available either here in this document or will be made available to you for download um, later. Um, FSX, it's basically a find SQL command, and one thing that you'll notice through the queries that I use for testing is that I often will put um, a, uh, a comment. So in my particular query um, that I used for this example, um, I actually had a comment at the very start of it that had kmtest-auto in it. So this script will look for the text of the SQL in the shared pool, and it will return back to me the SQL ID and child number and some information about how many times it's executed and what was it average elapsed time and so on. You can also see here that um, we've got a couple of columns here that are particular to Exadata. So if you happen to be working on an Exadata platform, it would show you whether or not you got any offload and what percentage savings that provided to you. So as you can see, I'm executing my tests in an Exadata environment, so I'm getting the benefit of, uh, of that um, added in here. I have another script that I also use, and the reason why I'm using this is because I want the SQL ID. If I want to get more data for the statement that I've executed, more than Autotrace can provide, I'm typically going to have to either mine the, um, the shared pool, I need to figure out um, the execution data that's already been stored away there, and in order to do that I need the SQL ID for the statement that, um, that is in question. So I have another script called RS, and it just stands for Recent SQL, and you can see here it's just a, um, a, a query against the vdollar SQL view. Now you could also make that against GV if you wanted, again if you're in a rack environment. Um, you could make it be a global, so you could see um, SQL on both instances if you had more than one or on all instances. Um, but my RS script basically says, go out and show me all of the SQL statements that have a particular pattern, so like my comment that I'm using. Um, and then it calls a little, another little script called DC Plan. It could all be in one script, I just have them separated um, so that I can use them individually. And all the second one does is it takes the SQL statement, the SQL ID, and it will input it into this call to DBMS display cursor. So with, um, with the display cursor um, procedure of DBMS XPlan, it takes as input the SQL ID and a child number. 
So again, from my output up here, I can see the SQL ID and child number from my original script, and I can simply just feed it into here with some parameters. All stats last will give you all of the detailed data from the actual execution of your statement, um, line by line for each operation in the plan. You can add additional um, uh, parameters to this to get more data. There's a lot of extra stuff out there, or a lot of things on the web available to you if you just go query for display cursor um, and uh, the all stats last commands. There's lots of great resources to give you this in more detail, so I'm not going to take the time to go over that now. But um, that's all it does. It basically queries the, uh, um, uh, the V$ dollar SQL view. And so here I'm showing you again what it would pull back. So I only had one statement that had my comment in it. I take that SQL ID and child number and it goes out and actually produces a execution plan that shows me the same thing that Autotrace did. And here's my uh, estimated rows column right here in estimated bytes. All my estimates that we saw previously, but if you scroll over just a little bit, you also get to see all of the actuals. Everything in these last few columns is what actually did occur. So the really great thing about this is now I see timing data per um, operation. I see um, uh, the consistent gets or buffer gets um, per operation here, as well as the physical reads and so on. And the other thing that you have available to you is you can compare if um, the estimate was 4.3 million rows and you got 1.7 million. You see there's some differences here. So sometimes those kind of differences can make um, uh, a difference in how Oracle will choose to order the plan. So that level of detail can help you uncover an issue um, or figure out what to do with it. So in this case, if I look down the list of operations, and I kind of look over at my actual numbers, I can see if I'm rolling things up right here, it looks like a big chunk of my time out of that 32 seconds, about 12 seconds of it was spent on this full scan of this one table. Okay? And then I can also see that right here at this step, where it goes to 22 seconds, 24 there, um, that's basically the hash join where that table was actually used. So it was used with a really here, in this case, a really small table. Um, that table only had 31 rows in it, um, but the hash join between the two actually took 11 seconds to retrieve the data and another 11 seconds or so to, um, to join it to that small table in order to reduce it. So I got 42 million rows, and at the end of the hash join, I only had 1.5. So I can see where most of my time went. 22 out of the 32 seconds went to that operation right there. Okay? And that is fantastic information. Now I know where I can focus. Is there any way I can make that better? Is there something else I can do to address um, reducing the time in that particular spot? So um, I, uh, I did want to let you know if you were wondering <laughs> if this plan up here was good, um, what I wanted to do was I wanted you to um, check out the plan or show you the plan um, for the same SQL statement that was um, uh, uh, in place before this one. Um, this plan that you see below here, I'll scroll up in just a second, actually took 50 seconds, whereas this plan took 32, 33. Um, and you'll, what you'll notice here is there's a bunch of nested loops in this guy. Whereas, um, and you see the index access is on these other tables down here. If you come back up to this guy, notice how it's basically all hash joins, and there's just virtually no indexes. There's just this one guy right here in, uh, in this guy. But if, uh, if I had histogram statistics in this case, um, it actually took 50 seconds to run, so 18 seconds more were added because the histograms that were in place caused the optimizer to switch from using hash joins to nested loops, and it ended up actually taking longer for the statement to run. But I have all of the data here if I um, 
if I look at my uh, measurements again, you'll also notice that my number of uh, buffer gets went way up as well. So um, my timing changed. I went from 32 to 50 seconds. I went from 1.7 million buffer gets to 7.7 million buffer gets. So there was a lot of repeated or um, uh, accesses for this nested loops plan that were avoided by the first one. So again, if you were wondering, was the, the original plan good? Yeah, it was pretty good actually in this case. So, um, so I'm going to just scroll on past that here. Now the, the next thing um, that I wanted to talk about was um, SQL Monitor. And I'm going to blow through. These are some of the screen, um, the uh, slides in the slide deck. Again, this will be made available to you. Um, so what about SQL Monitor? For those of you that are in uh, using Oracle 11, SQL Monitor was added in version 11 um, and it provides some really, really great detail. Um, Whenever you have any SQL statement that um, consumes five seconds or higher of CPU or I.O., so that's the key, five seconds or more of CPU or I.O., um, uh, statements will get monitored automatically. Now, I, there are a few um, times when you won't see every statement um, that is that amount of time, but you will get um, uh, the majority of them. And anything that takes you know, longer than that, um, you almost always will find it out there. Um, when you are dealing with SQL Monitor reports, one of the really cool things about this guy is, is that you don't have to use the Gather Plan Statistics hint or set statistics level to all. It collects what it needs without you having to kind of turn on or elevate the collection level. So for that reason alone, it's really pretty cool. Um, because it's looking to uh, gather information and increase metrics on statements that are kind of resource hogs, if you will. Um, if you happen to have a statement that is not being automatically um, captured and um, a monitor plan um, isn't generated for it automatically, you can use a monitor hint. So this is similar to the gather plan statistics hint but monitor will catch it if it's um, shorter running than five seconds or it's not turning up for some reason for you um, automatically. Um, you can also, if you don't want monitoring to kick in for a particular statement, you can turn it off using the no monitor hint as well. So um, here, um, there's a couple of ways, or several ways actually, but I want to show you a couple to how to generate reports. Again, I, uh, for this example, I need to know the SQL ID, so I could still use that little script that I showed you before that collects the um, SQL ID and child number out of the dollar SQL. Um, but it basically calls the DBMS SQL Tune package, um, and it's the report SQL monitor function. So um, the report level parameter gets set to all. Um, the type parameter, you have several options. Now, if you're in 11.1, you have three options. That's text, HTML, or XML. And I'm going to show you both a text form and an HTML form of this report. Um, so you have that available. If you have 11.2, um, you also have two additional. It's EM and active. The active one is really, really cool if you are um, wanting to kind of watch a statement as it executes with the report type of active for a SQL um, monitor report, you will actually get a display that is um, where it stands at that particular moment. And um, if you're using Enterprise Manager to review these, you can actually see it kind of update as it's running. It's a very, very neat um, feature. So in this case, I'm just showing you a type of text and uh, the uh, SQL ID um, that I wanted to display. So once again, if I look back over here, I have a little script that basically allows me to input the, uh, the SQL ID and then it executes what I want. Um, so in this case, I put in my SQL ID. It will display back my SQL statement and then it gives me a section which is labeled global information. So this is kind of the overall um, uh, end product, if you will, of how this thing executed. You'll notice that the status is done, so it's already completed. Um, 
and I get my start and stop times, the duration, and so on. So I get some information about it. In the section following, it also tells me down here was my total elapsed time of approximately 33 seconds. 32 of it was basically on the CPU. There was very little I.O. weight going on in this case, um, and just a little bit of other things. Um, how many fetch calls, again, how many buffer gets did it make, um, read requests, bytes, all of this stuff. And again, from an exadata perspective, I would see any uh, offload percentage um, if that had occurred. Um, so in the next section, this is pretty much what we saw with the uh, DBMS XPlan dot display cursor that we looked at previously. You'll see here that for each operation in the plan, you get um, not only the uh, the uh, rows estimates in uh, the column here. Um, but you also will see the actual data as well. So you've got your comparison. Um, you see if you scroll over again here, I get some more information about <clears throat> um, for each line. This is the part that I think is really cool because at a glance, if you look just at this activity percentage, without having to come and look at any of the, the rows or the read requests or anything at all, look what I get. I get a percentage here, so I know that almost 50% of all of the work that went into this statement happened at this particular operation right here. So this whole set of things that's representative of the hash join, um, it stands out. So we saw this in the other um, uh, display cursor report, but you can again see it here, and a quick glance at the activity column will show you that. It also is showing you um, how many different samples were taken and what was going on at the time that sample at, uh, for that particular operation, what was going on. So this guy was utilizing CPU. You'll see down here there's a smart, um, a smart scan. Uh, so that's the part of the Exadata stuff that you see there. And if there were other weight events that were, um, were primarily in the, uh, active at that time, you would also see um, those listed. In this case, there wasn't. So, I mean, I think this is fantastic. You get lots of great data, and you get a really quick way through this activity percentage column to see right where um, the most of the time that is being spent in your query um, uh, is consumed. So, pretty neat thing. Um, now there's a couple of other scripts that I did also want to um, show you and, and mention as well. Um, but before I do that, I'll hit back over here and show you one other thing. If you don't have the SQL ID, but you want to run a um, SQL monitor report for your current session, um, or basically any session, as long as you know the, uh, the SID, the session ID, um, you simply need to supply, instead of a, a, a SQL ID, the session ID. So here I just use syscontext to get my SID for my user ID. So I use syscontext of user env and I pulled the SID value out. So that would um, generate a report for my session. Um, if you knew your session ID or knew another session ID that you wanted to retrieve um, uh, the most recent SQL Monitor report from, you could also use this and put it in there. So that's, uh, that's nice to be able to grab that data. So again, I showed you these guys. Um, now, the other thing that I wanted to show you was what's it look like when it's HTML. So I'm going to pop over to here. And instead of using the text format, if I had used the HTML type in my statement, this is what I would see. So instead of having all of that text-based, I would actually get a global information section. And it does some really neat things in that it uses um, uh, color coding, if you will so that um, it can identify the different types of um, activity that, uh, is, that is in use. And it'll kind of translate a lot of that down into your, um, your plan. So once again, I have my activity column where I can see what's going on here. I have weight activity, and you can see it's in blue. Um, so I would know that you know that's the weights that are going on for that guy. And if you touch it or run your uh, cursor over it, you see that that was the uh, user I/O for the smart table scan. Um, anytime you run your cursor over anything, you actually get a little message about what it is, um, and you can see that 
pretty much all of the read requests are here and so on. So again, from a graphical perspective, you can see how much time things take with the bars, the colored bars that actually help you identify it. So, um, uh, so by using HTML as the type, you just get this, this type of a view instead of the textual. So depending upon your environment and your preference, you may want to do this instead. Okay, um, let's see here. So, um, what if you want even more? Okay, well, I think at this point, if you're looking at a single SQL statement, um, the SQL monitor reports in 11 and above, or the dbmsxplan.display cursor, um, are going to give you pretty much everything you need for just looking at an individual SQL statement. But if you want even more um, and you have the ability to access it, you can get um, active session history data or AWR, Automatic Workload Repository data. Now the catch here is that you do have to have a license for the Diagnostics Tuning Pack um, in order to be able to use this. Um, but I will say the, the good news is, is that it's really um, in the big picture of things. People complain sometimes that you have to have it and it's kind of over the top. Um, depending upon um, uh, uh, whether you, what your level of discount is with Oracle and all that, um, even list uh, a single named user for um, uh, one licensed user is um, only about a hundred dollars. So now, of course, you have to buy that in bulk. <laughs> so they, they get you a little bit there, but the what you get by actually having this licensed is a tremendous amount of data um, that is well worth it, in my opinion. So. Um, a couple of scripts Oracle provides are um, the ASH report, and with the eye on the end of it, um, if you're in a rack environment, um, it allows you to specify which instance you want it to produce the, the uh, report for. Um, and then on AWR, the one I wanted to show you was um, a SQL report. So like we've been looking at, if you know a SQL ID, you can um, uh, produce an AWR report for just that SQL ID to get data that has kind of um, for a statement that was ran in the past that may not be in the shared pool right now, but you can go look it up. So let me show you a couple of examples of these really quickly. Um, so here's an ASH report. Um, and uh, if you look, it gives you the time frame. So whatever you produce it for, you'll see that. Um, so I just did a little 15 minute report. Um, and the thing that I'm going to point you to is just the top SQL in, in, uh, in this guy because, again, we're talking about the metrics for SQL at this point. But you've got a whole bunch of other stuff. You can see um, by event um, kind of what was being weighted on and so forth. So there's lots of great information in here. But if you just want to look at the SQL, um, it'll actually show you which statements were um, consuming what kinds of resources, um, what row source. This is actually the step in the plan. Um, and, um, and then it shows you a little bit of the SQL text. And this happens to be the one that I was executing. You can see my comment in here. There's one execution of it, and here's another. And so you can um, get data about you know, the top weight events, the top um, row source, whether in my case it was a hash join or what have you. Um, and so on. If you click on the statement um, SQL ID, it'll actually take you and give you the entire SQL statement. So again, it's a way that you can um, kind of quickly get a list for the last few minutes or however long that um, you specify um, what was the SQL um, that was consuming the most resources in your database at that particular point in time. The uh, AWR report for a single SQL ID, um, if you have your single SQL ID, you can simply input that as a parameter to the report, and um, it's going to show you a couple of things. For that SQL ID, it is entirely possible that Oracle could produce more than one plan um, or plan hash value associated with that SQL statement. This can happen in Oracle 11 when um, cardinality feedback kicks in, or it can happen um, in any version with cursor sharing type um, queries or bind variable peaking, those kind of things. So you could get a different plan um, based on bind values and so on. So in this section, you would actually see if there was more than one 
plant hash value, and that can be helpful. Um, you will see if you click on the statement itself, it'll take you to a section for plant statistics, and you can get, again, the elapsed time, there's your buffer gets, um, and so on. So again, very similar to what we saw with the SQL Monitor and the DBMSX plan, display cursor reports, um, and then there's my execution plan with its detailed data and so on. Now, it does say this is the execution plan. It is, but you'll notice in these columns, once again, over here, what you're seeing is the estimates, not the actuals. So in the case of this particular report, you're getting um, uh, kind of the summary of all your details up here, but you don't get as much data as you do with um, the SQL Monitor report or the display cursor um, from DBMSX plan. So um, we've got that in place. Um, <clears throat> if you want more, uh, I'll just say uh, at this point, um, there's always extended SQL trace data. Now, I don't cover that um, here because you can have an entire hour or two or three or a few days talking about trace data. But in order to collect it, you can use the DBMS monitor package um, and use the session trace enable procedure and um, have it turn on tracing. And you get everything that happens um, during the trace uh, time period. Um, and it can give you all of the detail that we've already looked at from these other things, but it also gives you things kind of happening around your session. So you get more about weight events that could be affecting you um, that aren't really your SQL's um, fault or responsibility. Um, so, um, so with that, I just wanted to mention it because I'm a, a huge fan of it. I use it very frequently, but when you're looking to tune a single SQL statement or a single set of queries using the SQL monitor reports or um, the, the uh, uh, data out of the shared pool using display cursor um, is a fantastic resource for you. Um, and then I'm going to flip back over here real quick and I want to mention a couple of other scripts. When you get the um, uh, access to the uh, webinar materials, you'll find the SQL run stats. This is using AWR data, um, and you can see in here I'm actually querying DBA hist SQL stat and so forth um, to pull some data out of the AWR. So again, if you're licensed for that and you know a particular SQL statement, what you can do is you can pull data from AWR so that you can see how it's executed over time. Now, this guy had only ran once in my instance, so um, because it was my test statement. So what I would see here is it was captured during this particular snapshot and here's the amount of work that it did. But I, uh, and then I could also query the AWR and pull its plan out as well. So I just use the display AWR instead of display cursor and I can pull that out and there's my data again. So lots of ways you can get stuff. But here's one thing I wanted to show you that's kind of cool about this run stats deal, is what if you had a SQL statement that had been ran a lot of times over time? I want to show you what you get out of AWR. Now, if you'll notice here that across the snapshots that were taken for the past few days here, you'll see that the plan hash value has changed. As a matter of fact, it's changed a couple of times. So if you look in the elapsed time column, what you'll notice over here is that some of these guys look like they're taking a whole lot longer than some of the other ones. So what I can notice here with this is I can notice that in the, um, the plan hash value um, for this guy, it's actually a worse performing plan than the plan hash value 85227414. So um, I have some information. My plan changed for some reason. Maybe statistics were collected. Um, maybe a bind variable changed, something like that. But what I know is, is that this SQL statement can run, and it can run fast. So this gives me some really good clues and some actual ways that I can do things, like use a SQL profile, perhaps, to um, say, I want this SQL ID to use this plan. And I can do that with a SQL profile. So again, the metrics help me identify problems. So 
So when I have this, I can start looking for additional solutions and things that I can do to get my queries performing more optimally, whatever that may be. So um, the, to kind of wrap up, what I want you to remember through all this is the more data you have, the easier problem diagnosis is going to be for you. So whatever your preference and how you get the data, um, uh, get it. That's the whole thing. Because it doesn't really matter how you get it, just get it. Okay? The more data you have, the easier it's going to be for you to understand where the root causes of your problems within your SQL statements lie, and it gives you the ability to really laser focus and hone in on these guys and uh, get going. So thank you very much for your time. And so what I want to do now is just kind of open it up for some, uh, some Q&A if, uh, if there are any questions. Um, and James, if you've picked any up as, uh, as we've been talking and want to kind of throw them out, that'd be great um, as well. So. Hi Karen, thank you. The everybody will be on mute for the for this part as well, as I mentioned at the beginning. So I've got some questions in the the question panel already. So thank you so much for people that have asked questions as as they go along. Uh, now's your time to put some questions to Karen, and hopefully we can get to answer all of the questions. So uh, I'm going to start things off. Uh, with a nice easy question, the, the first question is, is about uh, resources and, and the PDF of the presentation being available. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, it will be, it will be available on the uh, Redgate website on allthingsoracle.com uh, and hopefully Karen will also put a link on her blog as well. So there will be lots of places that you can access a recording and resources for this session. Okay, so the first question, Karen, uh, is from Ramakant uh, Chauhan. I hope, hope I've pronounced that correctly, but thank you for your question. And they're asking, can we use gather underscore database underscore stats in place of auto system set statistic underscore level equals all? Um, the, the, the gather plan statistics, now and I, what you're saying there is gather database stats. That, uh, that is something different than what we're talking about here. Um, so you have really two choices to get the level of metrics that you want. It's statistics level parameter set to all, or for each individual query that you're testing, you would use the gather underscore plan underscore statistics hint as part of the query text. Those are your two two choices for that. Thanks, Karen. Mm -hmm. The next question from George uh, Zhang. Thank you, George. SQL Monitor Report is great, but it is not in 10G. Do you have some scripts that extract similar information in 10G? Um, yeah, I know. I wish it was in 10, but they brought it around in 11. So you're similar. Um, what would extract similar in 10G is using the gather plan statistics and um, uh, option. So statistics level equal all or gather plan statistics hint and use DBMS X plan dot display cursor. That's as close as you're going to get. And so the SQL monitor reports were kind of the next generation, the next level up um, of data uh, collection that's available to you. But it is only available in 11. So um, I'll just say DBMS explan dot display cursor is your version 10 and, uh, and lower option for 9 and 10, actually. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Ramakant. Thank you again. What is the difference between active session history and AWR report for current SQL statements for a particular session? OK. Um, AWR is, um, is the repository data. So ASH is being collected basically every second um, as um, things are executing on the database, so as SQL is executing. Oracle's collecting um, this active session data. So um, it is very frequent measures of um, what's going on. So think of ASH as the now. AWR is the later. So what will happen is periodically, depending upon how your um, DBA has configured the AWR metrics to be collected, let's say that it's once an hour. So at every hour, a snapshot 
of data is, is um, taken and stored in the repository. So think of AWR as kind of like a little bit of a roll-up. Um, AWR will not store every single metric that is available um, to you through the ASH data. It's more frequent. You're going to get a, a smaller subset. So instead of saying uh, you get a sample every second, you're going to get a sample every 10 seconds with AWR. So you lose a little bit of the, the granular detail um, uh, with what gets stored in AWR, but it's really the same data. Okay, so it's just the level level of granularity that is um, uh, kept and maintained. That's really the the primary difference. Otherwise, it's it's the same stuff, just two different levels of detail for it. Fantastic. Thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. uh, two questions here from uh, Rahul Pasagonta. So they seem to lead onto each other. I hope they do. Uh, thank you. Rahul, uh, so asking, how could I be using dbms underscore monitor dot session underscore trace underscore enable in an application connection pool that is held by the application and not a database connection pool? He then goes on to ask, and I hope this is something you can answer within the same question, would you rather have an application managed connection pool or a database managed one? Um. Uh, the last one would probably take way uh, way longer than than we have to to discuss that, um, and I'll, so I'll answer it with the uh, it depends. You know the the generic uh, pull it out of your uh, you know out of your back pocket question uh, answer to every question. Um, whether you use an application pool or a, from the application side or the database side, it. Um, it depends upon your environment, um, your needs, um, your expertise. I mean, there's lots of things that could play into that. So um, I think I'll leave that for, for another, another day. But the, uh, the Thanks, initial actually. question was, how do you use the DBMS monitor for a particular session? Um, this is actually where um, instrumentation, code instrumentation can come in. Um, you can find a particular session doing a particular um, query um, by simply looking at a V$ session and so forth to try to locate it. It's just hard um, because you do have this connection pool coming through. So what, um, what you want to do is help yourself by identifying portions of your application um, using, let's say, DBMS application info or some method by which you can identify um, specific tasks that you care about within your application. So whether that is um, a single query, and in that query you could put a comment in the query like I showed you guys to use here, um, so that that's part of the SQL, and you know that if you're looking for something, you can look for that comment and find all of the SQL IDs that, or the SQL ID that includes that comment and so forth, you can do that. And then once you get that information, that'll lead you um, to the SID and serial number and all of that. So it is possible, it's just not quite as easy um, when you are trying to pick up a connection pooled session that is executing something you care about and want to trace. So it's possible, it just requires a little bit more work on your part in order to identify it, either through your application by instrumenting it to help you identify those sessions or um, uh, kind of mining or looking through what's currently running on your box and identifying it almost visually. So, thanks, Karen. And uh, just on the topic of, of that difference between an application, or would you rather have an application managed collection pool or a, a database managed one? Uh, maybe if anybody knows of some good resources uh, available on, on this topic, if they could post it as a, a comment to this webinar. Uh, I also, also noticed quite a few of the All Things Oracle experts in the audience, so uh, I'm, I'm hinting at uh, potentially a good topic for an article, so please drop me a line if, you, if, if there's something you'd like to write about. Okay, on to the next question from Eric Nolly. Uh, thank you, Eric. As a developer, is there a compelling argument I can make to a DBA for access in a production environment to the tools, stroke metrics you discussed? I can and do instrument my own code that Oracle provides such a rich tool set that it seems a shame not to have access to it. Yeah, that one's a, um, uh, 
a sticking spot with a lot of folks, particularly when you think about if you have to have access to the production environment to uh, to get the detail. A DBA will um, will often be more willing to pull the data you want than to give a developer direct access to do that. At least that's been my experience. Um, but I wholeheartedly agree. I mean, there is such a rich tool set, and when problems are uh, exposed in the production environment, um, you need to get the production data, um, these resource metrics, in order to be able to um, really know what you're dealing with, because it could be entirely different uh, in what happens in your test environment. So, um, I mean, the compelling argument is, do you want to fix it or not? <laughs> uh, you know, that, that seems a little curt, but, um, but if, if the issue is that for security reasons and so forth, they don't want to provide direct access to it, um, then my argument would lean toward, well, here's what I want. If you can express to the DBA what kind of data you want, and provide them with the scripts or tell them I want this ASH report, I want this SQL monitor report, blah, blah, blah. They have access to all of that. So um, if they are unwilling or unable to um, uh, provide you direct access, then setting up some mechanism where you can request that data of them or tell them when you know a, a problem gets um, uh, exposed please provide this back to the development team so that we have that data to, um, to diagnose the problem with. So um, it, it's more of a political argument in many cases um, because they, they fear uh, things from a security standpoint in that you know, they're giving you access to something that um, you know, is, is um, a, a threat. Uh, for, to the organization for whatever reason, you know, you're not authorized to see actual data or what have you. Um, or it could simply be that um, some of these things um, require, uh, you know, resources in order to use them. So they don't want everybody out there um, looking maybe through the tools um, and, and using up resources. I actually was working at a client site once where um, the monitoring tools that everyone was using was putting such a load on um, on the production database. It's kind of like if a problem started happening, everybody would connect and start using all their tools and doing everything. And at that time, this has been a few years ago, at that time, the tools were actually causing the problem to be worse. So if you got everybody off and only had one or two people using the tools, um, then the tools weren't really the problem anymore. Um, so it was just kind of a, uh, a weird cycle. So I would just say I believe that the argument is if you want to um, really tune and optimize your code, you've got to have the data. Um, and so it then becomes the battle of how are we going to do that and working out the best um, you know, operational method to get that done. Great. Thanks, Karen. The next question is from AJ Kumar. Uh, thank you, AJ. Uh, is the SQL monitor data available in OEM online? Yes, it is. There's actually an interface through Enterprise Manager that is it's very nice. So uh, if you have access to that, that is the ideal place to, to go get it um, because you get your all your active reports and all of that through the Enterprise Manager interface. So yes, it is. Good. Thank you. Uh, the next question from Jason Hughes. Thank you, Jason. In regards to SQL Monitor kicking in after five seconds, is that five seconds total time or five seconds on that step in the SQL? Yeah, it, it's the way that they word it, and this is what makes it a little strange and why I said sometimes you get it and sometimes you don't. The way that it is, um, kind of build to work is that it will kick in after five seconds of elapsed CPU or I.O. time. So, um, so it's not necessarily elapsed time by definition. And the odd thing is I've seen it kick in sometimes um, for something that took maybe six seconds, but it didn't have five seconds of CPU or I.O. It was, you know, three of each or something like that. So um, but if you're, if you're concerned about it, like I said, from a testing perspective, you can use the monitor hint just to make sure. But usually if 
um, and the reason why I believe it's kind of stated that way is the real problem, guys, um, that that SQL monitor data is intended to help you with are the ones that are taking a long time. So something that's under five seconds, um, while it may be horrible, you know, in your environment, um, kind of from the overall, the worldwide, I guess, if you will, um, perspective, if it's under five seconds, um, you know, there are other ways to address that. Um, so it doesn't automatically kick in, so they're being a little selective about it. So, so it's a, it's a little bit of a crapshoot, but in general, um, as long as you have five seconds of one or the other, you'll you'll typically get the automatically generated SQL monitor report. Okay. Thanks, Kevin. Mm -hmm. uh, the next question from Bert Scalzo. Thank you, Bert. Does using DBMS underscore SQL tune dot report underscore SQL underscore monitor by itself require any extra licensing on the Oracle side? Um, you know, I'm not absolutely positive if that is um, also requires the, the diagnostics and tuning pack, but I do not believe so. Um, I will confirm that and can answer that back in kind of in the comment section um, on the uh, All Things Oracle. I will, I will make a point to look that up and verify that for you. But um, I don't believe it is. It does require extra licensing, but I, I could be wrong. I lose track of what they charge for and what they don't these days. So, so I'm I apologize that I don't know directly at the moment, but I will definitely verify that and put it out there. Thanks, Sam. Uh, next question from Luke has Masterless. I hope I've pronounced that correctly. In an AWR-based report, the number of SQL executions was sometimes reported as zero. Do you have any idea why that would be? Yeah, um, um, and I may be able to flip back over here. Um, this may be what you're talking about. The executions in the AWR data is reported as zero. When you see that, um, what you um, uh, in effect have is it's that that statement ran across multiple snapshots. So here um, you would have snapshot uh, 15419 through 421 and um, uh, or actually if I go upward um, since this is the latest one. The latest one is the one that was taken at 330 um, so this uh, 15421. If it's got a zero in it that basically means it's not done yet. So what you'll see is, is that you'll see um, uh, the execution won't get counted until the snapshot in which it completes. So, um, so at this point, where I see it going for consecutive periods, um, that is indicative of its running across all of those. So the total time, um, you know, would be accumulated. Um, in there, or it started and finished kind of right outside the time, or it was almost ready to finish, or something like that. So, um, so you may you'll either see it be um, a cumulative value where you got to kind of add it up across the snapshots, or it kind of started or uh, and didn't stop, or it started in a previous session and so forth, um, and that's why you would see a zero. And by session, I mean snap, so snapshot. Okay, thank you, Karen. Mm -hmm. The next question from Tyler Van Versen. Thank you, Tyler. Uh, firstly, Tyler would like to say uh, thank you, Karen. I uh, thought the presentation was fantastic. Uh, his question is, your original general notes about the cost of optimizing SQL versus spending on hardware are a common theme. It seems a general throwing hardware at it is better theme is gaining lots of ground with IT management. Seems easy to quantify, uh, so it makes sense. Are you aware of any detailed business analysis of the actual costs of focusing more on tuning SQL versus the cost of throwing hardware at the problem? Um, n not anything that is uh, probably has been published outside of you know individual companies that I've um, done work with. I mean, it's it's easier when you have a example of we just spent, you know, X million dollars on this hardware, 
and we then figured out that after we got it, things were still bad, and we went and spent two weeks tuning SQL, and all of a sudden everything is better. So, you know, the cost of two weeks of tuning versus the millions of dollars of hardware, you know, you could measure it a little bit more straightforward. Um, so I would kind of do what James did here as well. If anybody has knows of anything, um, I'd love to see it as well. But I don't know of anything formally done um, on that, um, uh, or who who might um, have published something like that. But I agree. I, I think it is kind of the uh, um, it's the thing. It seems like to throw hardware at a problem. And I have often thought that it's because hardware is a capital expenditure and software isn't, um, or you know, the development of software isn't. And so it's kind of how it all ends up looking on the books, um, or something like that. But uh, but certainly uh, um, the commitment to providing well-tuned, well-optimized SQL um, can, in in my experience can save hundreds of thousands of millions of dollars um, in hardware costs and all of that goes with that um, if people would just buy into it. But I think it's such an unknown. You can quantify a piece of hardware. You can say, you know, it, it will run this fast or it's clocked to do this much work, but um, it seems much more like magic to accurately quantify before you do it the uh, benefits of um, of tuning code, so um, I think they often reach towards something that is known um, and knowable, and it also has a um, an associated blame pointer with it. If you buy tons of hardware and it doesn't do what the vendor said it was going to do, or it doesn't provide you with the the results that the vendor claimed, then you kind of have somebody to to blame for your problems. So. Um, I think there's a lot to that, but, uh, but formally I don't know of anything but uh, other than experiential stuff that I, I do think it would be a, uh, it's a good idea to, uh, if someone could figure out how to measure that a little more effectively. Thanks, Karen. Uh, and Kellen Popin has just added a, a comment to this uh, to say that hardware is physical and tangible, whereas expertise is not. Uh, it can only be shown, so that's quite an interesting point. But Absolutely. Please, Absolutely. When, I, when there, there's already a, a, a an article on All Things Oracle, when I put the video up there, if anybody knows this good resources, as Karen said, please feel free to add them as a comment under underneath this webinar recording. Okay, well, a few more uh, questions that we can answer. Uh, next question from Azar uh, Mahmood. Thank you, Azar. <laughs> Is AWR SQL based on snap underscore ID in general for AWR? D does that make sense, Karen? Uh, no. Can you read it one more time? Okay. So, is AWR SQL based on snap? Is it? I, I'm. Yeah. Is it all based on the snap ID? Yeah. That's is correct. that? Yeah. Um, well, the SNAP ID is representative of the, the period in time at which the metrics were collected. So again, based on um, uh, the configuration of it, it could happen once an hour, once every 15 minutes, once, uh, you know, however frequently that the DBA configured it. So the SNAP ID is just a, um, a sequentially generated number that represents the, the next physical snapshot that occurred. So, um, so everything that was taken at you know noon, the snapshot that was taken at noon would be identified by that snap ID, and it's used to help join the various objects and so forth, or to filter things out. Um, you can use the snap ID to do that, but it's basically the equivalent, um, the numerical equivalent of the point in time at which the uh, the snapshot was was uh, taken. Thank you, Kim. Uh, next question from uh, Sandeep Batia. Thank you, Sandeep. Uh, so I think, how can I force a particular good plan for a SQL statement using the SQL profile from SQL Plus, not not EM? Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, with the way SQL profiles work, is you can you have a couple of choices, but as long as you can see, um, like I showed you guys, where there was a um, one plan hash value that um, looked like it was taking 
uh, a long time and another one for the same SQL ID that only looked like it was taking a few seconds. As long as you have the SQL ID and the plan hash value that's the good one that you want, um, uh, within the um, uh, SQL monitor, I'm sorry, why did I say that? And within the um, SQL profile, um, you can say, this is what I want. So there's actually a call, and I do believe I have a script that I can show you real quick. Let me see if I can just find it here. Uh, where would that be? Well, I don't know what, I'll tell you what I'll do. Um, rather than kind of go down that rabbit hole, because I will be hunting for a while, um, I, have a, um, I have a little script that I'll post with the other ones that um, just does it. It's basically just a simple call, and um, uh, you establish the profile by saying, here's the SQL ID I want, here's the plan hash value I want, and you give it a name, and um, then what it'll do is it'll store that, and any time that SQL ID um, is um, executed or a SQL statement with that SQL ID is executed, the optimizer will retrieve the plan for the good plan hash value that you provide and uh, and use it instead of computing a new plan or or what have you. So it's relatively straightforward and I'll I'll grab that and add it to the materials for the webinar so you'll have that available. Thank you, Cam. Uh, the next question from Rahel Said. Uh, thank you, Rahel. Uh, how do I check execution plan if my SQL underscore ID is not in a shared pool? Uh, that's where um, the uh, AWR would come in handy. Um, or if you don't have a license for AWR, maybe even Stats Pack. Um, but um, at that point, if it's no longer in the shared pool, then um, you would have to hope that your statement has been collected as part of one of the um, uh, either the stats pack or AWR snapshots um, and so if you have the SQL ID you can check the AWR and that one script that I showed you the SQL run stats and so forth or you can use display underscore AWR instead of display cursor for the DBMSX plan call um, with display AWR, you would provide the SQL ID also, and it would find the plan for um, that statement as it exists in AWR. So it could have been that it happened, you know, an hour and a half ago, and it got captured because it ran long enough. It was captured and stored in the AWR snapshot, but it has since been flushed out of the uh, the shared pool and is not available to you that way. So. Um, so that's my answer. You would you would want to try to pull it out of your repository um, by SQL ID if you have that. Thank you, Karen. Uh, we've just got time for two more questions, which I'll come on to in a moment. There's been quite a, a few notes, uh, a few questions about whether the, the webinar and the slides, etc., will be available afterwards. Uh, as I mentioned before, they will be. Uh, I'll post these up on the Redgate website and also on allthingsoracle.com and. If you subscribe to my newsletter, uh, you'll also be sent details of where you can find other recordings, but it's all pretty easy. If you go to redgate.com forward slash oracle hyphen webinars, you'll be able to find access to all of our past sessions and upcoming sessions. Okay, so last two questions. Uh, we've got another question here from Rahel, which follows on slightly. If we, if we use set auto trace, explain, should we be looking at statistics section and not the execution plan? Sorry. Yeah, um, if you use set auto trace explain, you're only going to get the explain plan. So I'll say don't use that. <laughs> um, uh, from you know within context of what we've been talking about during our time together here, um, the idea is to collect the metrics and the explain plan. While um, it is very likely that the estimates that are made and what it thinks it's going to do will be what happens, you don't get the level of detail um, that you would get by pulling the data um, from the shared pool through um, an actual execution and monitoring of that. So, um, so I would say set auto trace explain, don't use that, but use set auto trace trace only. 
and actually it would be set out auto trace trace only explain. Um, I, I would just I would avoid the explain part. Um, so uh, make sure you actually execute the statement and capture that data, not just an explain plan. Thank you. And the the final question from Aptin Sadin Zadeh. I hope I pronounced it correctly. Uh, please can you tell, please can you tell what the advantage of using the type em and active in eleven point two for dbms underscore sql tune dot report underscore sql underscore monitor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. The um, the advantage is that you're actually getting to see the um, the execution as it occurs. So that's fantastic. Um, you, you see it live, so that's the word active um, or the type of active. So if a statement is currently running, you can see where it is. So what step is it on? So let's say that um, you know, one of the hash joins in the plan was where it's kind of spinning and it's taking a lot of time in that step. Um, with the active reports, you actually see that. You'll, you know, see this, the, the activity pointer is basically saying right here is what it's doing right now. So it helps you to glean some um, information about, well, how much longer is this going to take, you know, um, or should it take, um, and kind of at what point is the query plan um, at this point in time. So kind of it's a... Uh, uh, it's a real-time view of it, and thus you'll often hear it called real-time SQL monitoring um, uh, with 11.2 and above. So that's the that's the big advantage to it is you can um, get all of the data, but you can get it while it's executing and get the nice graphical view and um, get pointed to the particular problem spots while they're going on. Thank you, Karen. And I'm oh, sorry, we do have one more question. I was actually waiting on some clarifications this is a question that was asked earlier by Enrique Avelis. So thank you Enrique. The original question so just bear with me. The original question is what did you do to speed up your query? And Enrique is referencing a slow query that took 34 seconds. How did you optimize it? Oh the one that, that I showed I'm assuming he's referring to. Um, actually the first optimization I kind of showed him backwards to you the the uh, the original query was doing nested loops, and um, and it was doing nested loops because there were histograms in place. So um, once we got the data that we saw there and saw that it was taking you know almost a minute with uh, with the nested loops plans, started investigating the um, estimated row values and the actual row values from the plan, and noticed quite a bit of discrepancy. And so, um, uh, reviewed the statistics on those objects, and noted that um, statistics had been collected um, just that day um, on them, and um, had been collected with a new parameter. So it had been collected with a method opt of for all columns size auto, whereas previously it had been collected with a, a for all columns size one, and. Um, uh, actually, let me take that back. It was collected with four all indexed columns previously. So what it did when it went to four all columns size auto was it computed histograms on every column um, necessary in the table that it found that where it thought it needed them. And so it was just a kind of reverse diagnosing it out. So when we saw the discrepancies, it led us to look at the stats. When we looked at the stats, we noticed new histograms were in place. So um, we basically uh, removed the histograms, ran the test, and the plan reverted. So the statement had actually been running in about 30 seconds or so uh, pretty regularly, and it had shifted to run in about twice as long because of this histogram collection. So the fix was to remove the histograms, and, um, and it reverted back to the, the all hash join plan and speeded it up. Great. Thank you very much, Karen. Uh, mm -hmm. we, did, we did get through all of the questions that were there. Uh, as I mentioned, anybody that you didn't have a chance to ask a question or something comes to you after the session, and particularly when you're viewing the, the slides and the recording again, uh, please feel free to, to jot these on as comments on all things Oracle. Uh, 
uh, the article will be there. Do you got a few contact details for us before we wrap things up? Uh, please hold on, so we'll provide details of the next session, which is in a couple of weeks. Uh, so Karen Wilson's contact details, we've got Karen Wilson's email. Uh, please follow Karen at Karen underscore Morton, and you can find out more stuff that Karen's up to uh, and some resources that she's writing and other places where she's speaking on her blog, which is karenmorton.blogspot.co.uk. As always, my contact details, my email, uh, james.mercer at redgate.com. Uh, please also follow me at all things Oracle, and you can connect with me if you want to on LinkedIn as well. Uh, please send any feedback uh, to myself through any of these or all of these channels. Once again, thank you very much to Karen for joining us and pre presenting this session. I hope it was useful for you. And I've been James Mesa, and thank you again for attending.